Hello boys and girls. In this video I want to talk about the line of research that I only came across last week, namely the uh, very strong connection between quantum fields and neural network theory. And uh, what emerges from that is tools um, from one field being applicable to the other. So uh, you can then use, let's say, Feynman diagrams to find stuff out about neural networks. And in the other way around, you can use neural networks to compute stuff for quantum fields. Um, I think the most senior researcher, um, if I'm not mistaken, from uh, this list of this paper in particular is uh, this James Harverson. And um, if you look it up, there have been a few papers in this direction in the last years. And um, nonetheless, I choose this particular paper because it's clearly some of the more advanced results there. And um, the, to motivate how things work, I'm also in this video going to explain some uh, results which were known for longer time. So there, uh, I suppose it's fair to say that um, this sort of uh, stochastic result for large neural networks that we are going to discuss uh, emerged in the mid 90s. And I'm going to explain this because um, I want uh, this, uh, this subjects, which I find very exciting actually, um, to be known also a little better. Um, in this video, however, I will not go into any deep mathematical analysis. Um, I have also not written down much. I will basically um, jump from tab to tab and um, nonetheless uh, give a sensible um, an, uh, explanation of these things. So I think everything that I say should make uh, sense in principle. And then you can delve into all these subjects on your own. Um, if you are actually interested, um, in doing something in this direction, let me know in the comments. I will also um, point to some Google libraries regarding neural kernel theory that I will also sketch out in this video. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, the requirements for the video are that you have like a basic understanding of deep neural networks, like the fact that uh, these neural networks encode uh, the parameterization of certain uh, functions and then if you have a big enough network stuff like universal approximation theorem the fact that you basically can represent um, functions in that space let's say uh, continuous functions densely and um, you it helps if you have a basic understanding about the ideas of uh, quantum mechanics so the fact that um, what you're interested in is uh, uh, transition probabilities and that they are expressed as some products in a Hilbert space. Uh, in this video I have a section um, where I uh, motivate the jump from the expressions that uh, we are going to be able to compute with neural networks um, as they are explained in this paper. Let me scroll down a second. Uh, how these uh, expressions connect to, uh, you know, scattering amplitudes in, let's say, some uh, Large Hadron Collider experiments, uh, this sort of stuff. So I have a, a small, uh, like, wake um, uh, Murphy section that concerns physics. Um, but my main goal is that uh, if you go away from this video and, and uh, have a vague understanding why these sort of expressions that you see on a screen right now are both relevant for um, neural network theory and for quantum field theory, then my job is done. Uh, as I said, this um, gives uh, the possibility uh, not just to compute stuff in physics, but for example, you might then be able to apply um, Feynman diagram calculus to um, compute uh, various aspects of neural networks as well. And so even if you come at it from a purely computer science perspective, uh, and have some uh, statistics background, then this might uh, be fairly helpful. Okay, so um, I have here um, just a bunch of bullet points that I want to go through. I might come back to uh, this from time to time. Otherwise, I will just 
uh, jump through like here 15 tabs or so and and explain some some results um i uh, am actually currently working on uh or started working on a video that i maybe want to make as my sum for summer video where i will do like a painful uh, analysis of the universal approximation theorem uh, but that's like months and months out in this video i'm basically just rambling um, i hope you don't expect to uh, neither deep or concise um, elaboration so I'm, I'm warning you already but nonetheless um, i would really uh, recommend that you listen up okay so um First off, if you, as you have just uh, seen in the bullet points, um, I will uh, explain to you, um, like sketch out this result from the 90s, which concerns neural network Gaussian processes, right? So there are uh, nice results that have been found there and have since been extended to a, you know, a broad range of neural network architectures. Um, so this is mathematical theory results for neural networks that hold in general. Um, yeah, in this video, for simplicity, we are, uh, can just look at fully connected, in the sense that you see in the screen here, feed-forward uh, neural networks. Um, and for this video, it, it's not even super relevant uh, how many inputs or outputs you have. Basically, you have, let's say, at least one uh, input, some float, or if you want a real number, x that just goes in one uh, real number y that goes out and in the middle you have uh, a bunch of uh, hidden layers in uh, the image you just see one but you you know for the sake of it you might think of two three four something like that and you see uh, the nodes in this one hidden layer here and um, the theory that we're going to discuss kicks in once you have a really big network so um, this uh, you think of the number of nodes in each uh, hidden layer here going to infinity or you know it will suffice if you think of a huge number a bunch of billions of billions and um, the the thing that then emerges with um, large networks uh, is not just the universal approximation theorem that says the the nice functions let's say continuous functions from r to r are represented densely by this sort of neural network, by these weights, but uh, what also uh, um, emerges in this uh, large network limit is that the dependency of uh, the output for fixed input and um, probabilistic weights uh, takes on a very deterministic character. Okay, so this is uh, this neural network Gaussian pr process phenomenon and then I will explain in a second in, in more detail. But basically what we want here first to look at is we take one fixed architecture, some big neural network with let's say three hidden layers and um, all the layers are very large. And uh, what we here are first concerned with before we talk about tangent kernels, before we talk about quantum field theory, is we few um, uh, we are concerned with the random initialization of these networks, right? So let's say you are on a computer, you you have this network um, encoded um, uh, on your GPU or whatever, um, and um, or the, the weights really. I mean, the you have the architecture laid out the way in which all the 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 um, float data. Um, pass to each other um, naturally if you have this this flow types um, in every uh, realized configuration the weights have to have some um, some value and uh, this gives the start um, configuration for the learning process right in the learning process you're going to uh, probably uh, assign some some uh, loss function and you do gradient descent and then you tweak the network to behave in a certain nice way and um, fulfill some task but to start this process you need to uh, initialize the network you uh, you want to um, maybe explicitly set some weights okay and now what you can do is you can play around with what is actually your starting condition right you can say hey um, should all the weights in the beginning be set to zero or um, be set to one 
or and this is the interesting thing here um, you do a random initialization of all the weights and biases also so um, think of um, you know you're in Python you uh, take your library and you sample from a normal distribution for all the um, tr trillion weights you sample trillion random numbers and you sample them each from a Gaussian from a, from a bell curve and then set the corresponding weights like this okay so um, all these uh, w i j are sampled from some from some Gaussian and um, when you like uh, put in some input right we said there's one input let's say you uh, you take the input 7 um, and set uh, x to 7 and then uh, feed uh, do the feed forward process the evaluation of the neural network then if these things are random uh, then the output will also be some um, essentially random number it will be determined by whatever um, random weight you have sampled here and in this way you can think of y uh, for fixed x as a random variable composed of the random variables w right so we have uh, here's the uh, neural network gaussian process uh, page uh, the math and the proof sketch of this result that we are going to get to uh, is actually described there so the weights are sampled from some Gaussian. We are going to take a Gaussian where the, the standard deviation uh, gets tighter and tighter with the number of layers, right? But if you have a fixed network, this is some fixed um, uh, variance here. And the the output that in a, is in a standard way uh, computed from neural network is um, computed as you see here you do fast forward and I think it's uh, fairly uh, easy to believe that just due to the central limit theorem right the, the statement that if you have a bunch of independent um, random variables if you sum them all up then uh, this is another random variable that will behave like a Gaussian process right so basically if you sum up random numbers then you usually end up with um, if all the conditions are fulfilled, all the mathematical conditions, then you will end up with a Gaussian. This is the statement of the centri central limit theorem. And this exact thing applies here also, you know. Maybe there are some non-linearities involved and maybe there's different steps, but in the end, the final output of the network here um, in this picture in the, the on the last layer, this set um, is still a function of all these small Gaussians. And because there are so many sums, this is again just... Um, a Gaussian process right so and so this this says that in the limit and this is especially emerges if you have enough um, width if this is, if it if the width is big enough so that the uh, central limit theorem really kicks in but this basically means that uh, the as a random field as a random variable uh, the output of the neural network has very nice stochastic process um, uh, properties and it's it's a uh, uh, Gaussian process in particular, one of the nicest you can have, basically. Um, here on this web page, uh, on this Wikipedia page, there's also like this, this, uh, this, uh, this example um, animation. So here they have um, some network with three inputs, right? As I said, it doesn't have to be three. It suffices to think of one, and they have a bunch of outputs. Or again, it suffices to to think of one. So one green input, one. Um, a yellow output um, and a, a bunch of nodes in in bunch of layers in this case two layers one layer would also work um, you will see on the right side I mean you probably don't see it just because of my face here but uh, I mean doesn't really matter too much it's just a, a bunch of like uh, random distribution the statement is that for fixed input the green value le again let's say there's one green input and it's set to this the float number seven if you um fix uh if you go up with the the number of nodes uh, and random initialize this with weights and biases then just by the central limit theorem which is uh dependent on this this seven and this bunch of random numbers the output uh y1 here this uh, yellow output uh, will behave uh, like a Gaussian just by the central limit theorem 
and um, in this case there's two outputs so you can uh, draw a plot and the statement is then that both y1 and y2 behaving like Gaussians in the, um, independently from another uh, like uh, like it's not a st statistical statements, but each behave like a like a Gaussian. They ha have some peak, and so on the plot uh, you get another nice uh, Gaussian with some peak here. Right? Um, and so if then the I press play again, if the network becomes even bigger, then you get like this perfect Gaussian um, where it, this just says that it has this maximum um, expected value here in the middle. And this goes for all the outputs, right? So uh, this is the result that that um, that um, the okay. I closed the neural network Gaussian process page, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this is the result that um, just because of statistics, you the network if, if it's large enough, at random initialization behaves like a Gaussian. Uh, we will not need it for uh, the uh, this video, but if you want to take a look, um, this is the, the formal definition of a Gaussian, pr Gaussian process. I mean, to motivate this, basically you think, you know, a Gaussian is something which if you do the Fourier transform, it's again like a Gaussian and the Gaussian process is abstractly defined as this random variable or sequence of random variables where the characteristic function, the expectation value of this phase uh, is this Gaussian with a certain mean. Uh, we are not going to need this. Um, the Fourier transform will pop up again when I talk about um, the quantum field theories. But uh, suffice to say, the nice thing is that the neural network, the big neural networks behave like uh, Gaussian processes. Sorry if I repeat myself. Um, uh, okay, so... Do we do physics first or do we do neural tangent kernels first? Um, let me actually, um, yeah, let me actually say something about uh, the uh, neural tangent kernel. So, um, could we know now that the, the, the network at the start behaves like this Gaussian for all inputs and uh, if you do the learning process, then this is about um, giving it a test data and then moving um, in parameter space from wherever we random started to some other position in in weight space. And I have made a bunch of videos on gradient descent. I will not explain it here, but suffice to say, you have a space of weights and then the, the weights follow some uh, path and you um, do that in a way that optimizes some goal that you have, right? Some task for the neural network. And I think I sketched it out um, here. So um, as is common, uh, we're dealing with not only here with a large neural network so that the theory becomes simpler and nicer, but also um, we are imagining we have so much compute that we can do really small step sizes so that we can then in the limit talk of the behavior of the network um, as in, in a differentiable way where we say um, the, the, the motion uh, of the um, in path space uh, in a parameter space uh, can be described you know with literally just calculus differentials and so the gradient descent algorithm what we're doing really is um, you know as per instruction of the algorithm we say the change of the weights and here I abbreviate all the weights together with this uh, theta the the change in the weights right from from one point to the next in the graphic that you just saw um, is chosen in a way that it uh, takes the negative direction of the gradient of some uh, cost function and the cost function in here is uh, the you know the, the the difference essentially between what the neural network currently says versus where we want to get at, um, where set is all the learning data that we have available, right? So we we say uh, for all the learning data that we, that we have, um, there is a discrepancy between what the network F uh, currently um, says 
um, what's correct and what is actually correct. Why I said here is what's actually correct. Um, and we send that up. And so this is like the, the, this, the cost of all uh, learning data together. And at every step in time in the learning process, um, we go, uh, follow this path, right? And this equation is uh, really just uh, the Newtonian equation um, where, um, you know, in, in physics, um, uh, theta would be the momentum. And where you um, look at the situation where the force on the right-hand side is governed by a potential, and you say, um, the, the direction of motion um, captured by uh, the momentum is is given wherever the you know potential energy uh, will be lowest, and that's where the, the path followed by the particle in Newtonian physics, right? So this already looks very um, uh, like like this simple uh, physics uh, equation gover governing governing the motion in weight space, and now. Uh, given that you have uh, the behavior of the, um, the the particle, if you will, m uh, going through weight space, like in the GIF you just saw, um, and the uh, the uh, potential depends on the outputs at the network on all these spaces, you can also then um, do the calculus and, and look at, hey, how does the output of the network, which depends on the position where you are at, right? Where the weights de determine what the network out output will be on all the um, learning data. How does the, the F change? And so if you do them, just do the math, um, and I think I have this, this here. So this is um, neural tangent kernel theory. Um, if you, mm, if you do this sort of calculation and if you uh, you know if you ever studied physics you have to do this, this sort of calculation uh, a million times because basically if you have some observable uh, in the physical system and you know all the the constituents of the particles behave in this and this way and then I have some observable which is made out of particles and you say how does this this observable quantity change then um, you, you have to plug in a bunch of partial derivatives and then the Hamiltonian comes in and whatever and so on and so forth what comes out of this is that the development of the output of the neural network um, is uh, governed by some matrix this is the so-called neural tangent kernel and the changes of uh, the the loss in uh, with respect to the to the weights, right? So I mean, uh, I, do, I didn't adopt this terminology. Theta is again the, the, all the weights together, and um, you can uh, uh, do this calculation on one sheet of paper yourself. Um, I'm not going to discuss all the the uh, convention uh, and notation chosen here. But the point is that the evolution of the output on the network from your uh, starting point, which might be a random starting point, um, is understood at least here in theory. It's another question of whether you can actually uh, calculate that because this matrix which de determines how this the output of the network evolves as you do the learning according to gradient descent, is determined by this complicated object uh, theta and the theta is basically this so-called kernel um, this is you can view this as the inner product of the gradient of the output with, res with respect to the weight change and so the interpretation is basically uh, that um, you, you look at uh, different inputs and then you um, you as a kernel, a kernel roughly charges how similar input data are. And this kernel basically looks at, uh, hey, these two input data are similar if upon a change of the weights, the, um, the response of the network changes in a similar fashion and you compute this it's in a product. Uh, in any case, this is like an interesting object that in the end determines how the network behaves. Uh, and similar to neural network Gaussian uh, process theory where you say hey, once I have enough um, um, weight, uh, weights uh, in my layer some nice theory emerges right in, in, in the Gaussian network uh, case um, it goes towards a Gaussian it's also the case that 
for a large network, uh, then this this matrix uh, can simplify, and then you can get uh, in the infinite uh, net, uh, size network also to an analytical theory. And basically, you random initialize. You already know it's some Gaussian process, and then you have some matrix which, which determines how the network moves um, through through weight space and um, thereby you, you have an idea of actually uh, what happens during network tra network training, right? So if you have never heard that and more or less followed my explanation, then you can see this is uh, kind of cool that at least in these limits, you um, have a sort of an analytical idea what happens during learning. And then uh, the question is uh, to what extent ex um, is this sort of uh, logic valid for networks as we can implement them at the moment at the moment because of course uh, we have a lot of weights like billions of weights but it's not infinite so um, you might ask uh, to what extent is the analytical theory where these limits are taken right so uh, super small step size very large networks uh, applicable to today's convolutional and deep neural networks and so on and so forth and this is basically a, a subject of study so this is um, something where people still uh, put a lot of time in and so for example you have here this uh, Google uh, uh, neural tangents um, uh, project um, which I might be interested in looking at and there's a bunch of Google researchers who are still using this and publishing papers in this and, and so on and so forth. There's also, I think, a recent um, NeurIPS uh, poster from 2019 where you get uh, some of the examples of analytical formulas that I talked about. Um, just because I want to get to the quantum field theory part, I will not uh, discuss this in detail, but I am... Um, I hope my uh, tangent, uh, pun intended, uh, was interesting. And as I said, I would also actually like to uh, to work a little bit in this direction myself. So if you want to look into that, um, feel free to reach out and we can do some sort of project together. Okay, so um, now for the the um, the field theory part. What's still extremely important for us is this uh, neural network Gaussian process insight. Okay. And if I'm here in the paper on page four, um, then um, let's make first some definitions. Okay. So here we have these correlation functions, uh, which we'll call GN. Uh, for, uh, for concreteness sake, you can think of N, uh, let's say, as two. So um, we are going to actually look at um, two different um, forward passes for the neural network, right? So you have two different inputs that you want to try X and you um, plug them in and you get something out of your current network, uh, which might be random and init initialized. Um, and if you, um, as we had it with the neural network Gaussian process case, view your weights as a random variable, right? Over all the, the weights, over all your uh, trillion weights, you put a little Gaussian and let them wiggle a little bit. Um, and you say, what typically happens if I sample once and um, uh, put into uh, inputs X, uh, how are the inputs on a, on a typical or random network correlated with each other then you can you can try this a, a bunch of times and get an idea um, what you can also do is um, analytically if you know the distribution of all your weights um, compute what, what will come out right so you have here uh, p over the weights this is the distribution that you yourself chose from which you can sample and uh, for fixed neural network architecture um, the the weights and um, the neural network um, which um, is here called phi this is the um, function that depends on the weights depending on your architecture right so this is the sigmoids and the sum and so on and so forth and so uh, 
the correlation function gives you how these, how let's say two inputs are um, correlated with each other for this network, right? And by the neural network Gaussian process result, if uh, we said that uh, this, this bill trillion uh, 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 probability distribution over the weights um, make the input output relation of the whole network also into a random variable, right? So you can also view uh, this the setup that you have here not as a um, as um, not just assembling um, the weights and uh, getting uh, the fixed input output, but you can also view any sample process as sampling a whole neural network, right? I mean, this is just what you do if you sample, if you random initialize for fixed architecture, um, the um, uh, certain uh, functions, a cer certain neural network, then you've also sampled the neural network from who knows what distribution, right? So there's also this different the different view of this initialization process and then um, by the result of the neural network Gaussian process what you have is that you can also f view the same uh, exact object this correlation function or any expectation value really um, as in terms of a distribution over the, these functions themselves and by the result that we just had for a large network this will be a Gaussian process and this manifests in this way, right? So um, here is the integral not over the weights, but over the um, the uh, whole function that the network represents itself, and um, the the um, probability distribution that you have in this case is um, of of this sort, where this s. Uh, and now this relates back to the uh, formal definition of the Gaussian process, is some quadratic, let's say, and maybe some local terms, um, cost associated with the whole um, with the whole function. So basically what, what this does, I mean, do they give here some examples? I think they do. Um, um, Okay, so this is already a sort of a physical example, but what you have as S here in the the exponent is some uh, sum over all uh, the values of the network. And what what they, like what in effect happens is that um, the um, the, the uh, this this weight is such that. Um, field configurations um, and when I say field now I always just mean the same as the input output relation not given by the neural network um, field configurations or neural networks where at one uh, places you get a, you know, a huge output these are just exponentially suppressed because um, if you random sample from the with the weights then you are not likely to get um, some basically you're you are going to get um, neural networks in, uh, in initializations which are around some some uh, some certain um, typical expectation value like they, they have there are some typical behaviors and everything that deviates uh, a lot from it is uh, like expo exponentially less likely right you um, if you do um, thousand random initialization of the neural network you will get some typical behavior and then you can cook up some other extreme behavior that is not likely to happen and um, by the result of the neural network Gaussian process um, theory um, it tells you what the the, so the probability distribution looks for the neural network so th there is this connection that you have here right and as I will motivate um, later uh, in quantum field theory this is exactly sort of the setup for the path integral and what this paper does is it um, if you view um, the, um, the this, this sort of um, mathematical um, overlap um, as a physicist and you want to use neural networks as, 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 as a physicist you, you see this as a way to um, then try to craft neural network architecture and sampling techniques right the, the way in which you sample the weights in a way so that the this, this whole process of random initialization corresponds to certain SS, certain 
uh, actions here, right? You do you have some physical scenario in mind. There's physical theory that says, oh, you know, uh, certain scalar field theories have this and this action. What is the way I and in which I mu uh, must set up a network and the way in which I must uh, sample the weights? so that what I sample is exactly as if I would sample from a quantum field, like like as if I would sample from, uh, would I would sample a field which is one instance of um, a quantum field in the path integral formalism, right? And then I get out a bunch of correlation functions, these endpoint functions, um, and these are exactly the things that are uh, what what you do quantum field theory for, right? You you compute these Gs, and then I will explain it later. Then there's some uh, mathematical connections to how you get from these this, um, this, uh, uh, Gs to um, the scattering amplitude or whatever your quantum field theory does. Um, maybe particle physics, solid state physics, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, let me see. So this, as you might notice, this is a very free flow uh, sort of explanation, right? Um, so I have to check uh, what I have touched upon and what I didn't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, from the very complicated quantum field theory math, you get some, uh, you know, uh, relations of um, uh, how the correlation function must relate to these actions, and there's a bunch of um, stochastic differential equation mathematics involved. And because uh, in physics the evolution is always governed by some Hamiltonian operator function. There's a bunch of energy terms that you um, have to kick around. And that's why, for example, um, these objects tend to look a little bit like this. Um, like if you uh, never studied this, this physics, um, maybe one way in which you should look at this is that because the evolution of these fields, like how they um, evolve in time is governed by uh, the Schrodinger equation, which relates the uh, time derivatives, uh, like the, the evolution um, of the fields th themselves to some energy expression uh, captured in the Hamiltonians and um, the uh, the energy, kinetic energy and, and um, in particular uh, for fields is given by some spatial operators. That's, that's why these sort of objects pop up here and you know, mass energy equivalence. That's why I also have mass. And so if you see this uh, Laplacian operators or mass terms, um, you should not be too surprised uh, there because in physics, they just always pop up in relation to the time evolution of the the fields. Okay. So, okay. Uh, now I've already touched upon the concept of time. The thing is, of course, that um, here, this, uh, the fields as they pop up here, will uh, be um, not uh, like what you get there is the better controlled theory of uh, Euclidean fields, right? You're not uh, you're not having to do a priori with space time metrics and all these things which make uh, field theory, quantum field theory extra complicated. But um, uh, just talking about Gaussian processes is just talking about stochastics and then uh, there is this sort of bridge that you have to take and hope that you can get from the the Euclidean field theories to um, to some actual quantum field. And I, I will just name drop um, a bunch of concepts there. The idea is that you, uh, if you approach quantum field theory with this neural network uh, shebang, then um, you want to uh, find a neural network which mimics the weak rotated version uh, of um, of a physical quantum field. And so there is um, a bunch of uh, so-called constructive quantum field theory coming in. So there are various approaches for, of people trying to um, uh, make certain aspects of quantum field theory more rigorous and um, 
like get rid of uh, pseudo metrics in quantum field theory, move everything um, to the Euclidean domain where you have nice metrics. And um, uh, so in this paper, for example, they say that, um, you know, uh, what we really want to impose is um, neural networks, which when you view them as a field behave in a certain way. And something that is important there, for example, are these uh, osterwald schrader uh, relations. So for example, here, in this case, the um, correlation functions, um, these particular correlation functions of relevance here are called denoted S, and then you see on the screen a bunch of properties that these shall have, right? So the, you have the physical translation invariances of certain objects and uh, certain sym symmetry or independence relations, right? I'm just mentioning this, that there is, uh, it's not like um, you just take any neural network and then you get uh, some uh, some quantum field theory in a path integral formalisms out of it. There's a fairly restricted subset of uh, fields that the physicist for quantum field theory might be interested in. Um, okay, but I should probably not go into too much detail on that uh, here. Um, yeah, uh, also the, um, these objects in this um, exponential, so, sorry, here, um, if, you, if you know some physics then you know this, but um, if you don't, then just want to mention that these sort of S's, um, basically any S that you can write down, uh, gives you some field theory, these S's are some sums or integrals over energy terms. And if you go to, um, sorry for the click, clickery, um, if you go to the Lagrangian field theory Wikipedia page, then you can find a whole lot of different um, S objects that make sense. And you can here see how they data mine, how they determine um, the various physical theories that you have certainly heard of. Uh, we are interested in particular about fields. So we have here uh, scalar field theories. This is what we just saw. You have some Laplace and then um, some, um, some mass and uh, there will be also be some time derivatives there. Um, but the thing is that the pure Gaussians are um, where this is just this quadratic object in, in S are actually re relatively um, uninteresting from the physical perspective because if you have, for example, if you have different uh, quantum fields that interact with each other and, and then this information, how they interact is also all encoded in this, in this, um, in this Lagrangian's else or in the action S. And then uh, you will have some more complicated products in these objects. And um, if you have some power of the field that's higher than two, then this is actually uh, representing uh, so, sort of self-interaction in, in field theory. So um, what we really want to have is not just um, the fields uh, which fulfill these nice um, properties in the Euclidean version, but we also want to have very finely controlled um, interaction terms there. And so what we really want to have is uh, f um, process with processes which are actually not Gaussian, right? And so what they do in the paper is, in, in, in the end, um, look at uh, f um, phi to the fourth field theory, so quartic interaction. Let me see, sorry. So what they really want to implement and what they actually then do in the paper is they uh, take this sort of action. You, n you not only have this quadratic term there, but you also have their, um, this phi to the four uh, term. And to, to get this in, to get um, uh, away from the just quadratic Gaussian process scenario, there is uh, two ways um, to implement this self-interaction. Uh, and one way is to actually not look at the infinite and limit, right? Not the infinite um, 
size network limit um, because then uh, the uh, you basically break the neural network Gaussian process scenario you you perso perso uh, you purposely stop a little bit earlier and get some non Gaussian effects and so what from the mathematical point of view is a bug that for a real network you actually don't get a perfect Gaussian situation here becomes a sort of feature it gives you the freedom to actually implement behavior and if you tweak the network uh, nice enough the idea is that then you can sort of control how it is broken this bug certainly becomes a feature this is one way and the other way is if you um, actually um, in sampling you do not uh, take a trillion independent distributions over the weights but what you instead do is you introduce on purpose some uh, dependencies of the individual weight uh, distributions right you, you break the independence such that um, there is a little bit of a flaw in the central limit theorem and in this way by independence you also get some non uh, gaussian process because it's clear that if you do only um, break the independence of these weights a little bit, you still, by the central limit theorem, get something which is just a slight deviation from these Gaussian processes, right? So if you, the idea is if you uh, tweak the this, the conditions for the for the central limit theorem just in the right way, then you might produce um, uh, errors to the, the the Gaussianity in a. Uh, in, a, in a very controlled way uh, and this is exactly what they do here so here they describe a neural network with uh, particular non-linearity as, as activations it looks like this and uh, what they do is they, they sample in this um, in this dependent way in exactly the correct way so that the um, the action um, that emerges by random sampling in this uh, in a particular way represents uh, this uh, this sort of physical field theory so this field theory in particular is basically always the first interaction uh, interacting field theory or one of the first interacting field theories that you would learn in the quantum field theory course um, this is not one of the famous standard model um, uh, energy uh, densities at least not in the exact same way here but nonetheless this is like a classical physical theory and so this is what this paper is all about right breaking the neural network Gaussian process uh, theorems in the correct way to get um, the the right uh, G functions endpoint functions out there that are relevant for physics um, and so you see that then you can in, you know in principle sample uh, from this fixed uh, neural network architectures fields and then once you have uh, like a way of sampling fields you can in principle because the fields determine all the properties of the quantum uh, field theory uh, compute expectation values and thereby get physical uh, information so this is the idea it also goes in the other direction in um, since there is uh, these methods, in particular um, Feynman diagram computation methods that compute correlations um, for quantum fields, you also have a method of computing aspects of random initialized big neural networks, right? You have a big neural network, you know that if you uh, uh, do, do sample from it, it, it is as if you would sample from a quantum field. Um, and because you have ways in physics to compute aspects like correlation functions and so on of the quantum fields, these uh, G functions that you can compute in physics with Feynman diagrams and so on also have a relevant meaning for computing typical aspects of random initialized neural networks. Okay, <laughs> I know this is a little bit much, but I hope it sort of makes sense. Um, I um, I don't know how clear everything was that I, <laughs> that I discussed so far. I just want to give you uh, this is then more on the quantum field theory side, a uh, little motivation that I have just here written up 
um, that connects these G functions, right? These autocorrelations to physics. I just want to motivate it maybe. Uh, give me here three more minutes. So uh, I, I'm going to assume that you have an idea of uh, the fact that transition probabilities are the squares of inner products in a Hilbert space in quantum mechanics. Um, so there's this um, kernel objects K, which are given like that. So in, 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 in you know, standard quantum mechanics, what you have is some, um, you have some in, um, current state, which I call here in, and then you have some uh, other state out that you're interested in, you want to know what is the chance that this state um, transitions over in that state. What you do is you um, take the Schrödinger equation uh, evolution, which is governed by the Hamiltonian H, in, in the nicest case, um, here the formal solution of this equation is just e to the i h. So this is the operator which uh, moves any state forward in time. You apply it to in, to the t uh, like let's say this is now, this is in two days. You say this state that I have currently, how will it in evolve into the, in, in uh, like how will it look in two days? Then you basically apply this operator to fast forward this thing. Um, and then you get something, uh, the, the in state, how it will look like in two days. And then the product with this object in two days with the out state that you're interested in gives you the probability that the, the, the current state after it has evolved is going to be observed in the, in the out state. Okay. So this is basically quantum mechanics 101. Um, the, uh, for whatever Hamiltonian you have here, you, um, can often then compute some analytical case, some kernels. Um, these are these things. And I think here, if you scroll down in this Wikipedia page, you find some examples. So these are just, you know, in this case, uh, free particle in one dimension. This is like some, some Gaussian. This is similar to uh, some uh, heat uh, dissipation uh, equation. And then if you have some more relativistic scenario, I think they also write down here some this more complicated um, correlation functions um, and examples. Okay, uh, so that's the one thing. Now, if we talk uh, quantum field theory, um, then. Yeah, the, uh, this is basically just a definition. Um, the, the G's, we all also had that in the paper, are certain expectation values, right? So there, since we're on the pure relativistic side, not the Euclidean side, there's some time operator there, but you can basically ignore it for, for the moment. The, the point is that these G's are determined by some fairly simple looking uh, expectation values and in the in the quantum mechanical formalisms, these are also some inner products in some Hilbert space. Of course, in a quantum field theory, there is no super nice theory um, about uh, Hilbert spaces and 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 these operators. So there is it's more like a uh, like a functional definition. This is what you uh, calculate, and um, you hope it's somebody else comes up with the sort of rigorous setting uh, to compute this. But nonetheless, you know how to compute these G's. Uh, you know how to uh, uh, set up the an evolution equation of your choice and make sense of these correlation functions, which is um, what you want to get at in the first step. So given um, you have a definition of these Gs, there is actually then a sort of a generating function in the, in the um, you know, analysis generating function sense. There are these partition functions which look like so. So you basically, we, we can view it like starting from this. We start with some, some definition where all these G's are um, captured uh, in this sort of formal sum, formal sum of products. And then these G's are, once you would have this uh, uh, partition function with this uh, J parameter, you can in principle, like formally speaking, with functional derivatives compute this G from this thing. And then there's this whole quantum field theory. I mean, this is what quantum field theory is all about. That tells you <clears throat> how to compute this this set. And this is then exactly uh, this sort of object. 
this is what we already had have had there right we already said that um, if you um, take the expectation value of e to the minus s in the Euclidean case i s here um, of a product of these phi's you get um, all these these g's and this is basically sort of the generating function trick to get to this to this sort of objects <coughs> okay um okay so this is the, what you do in practice and uh, just to motivate also the how um neural network sampling would be done another way of getting at this these g functions which you want to to have okay and and so to round it up to say to to explain how this this this, this simple g's this field theory um uh, correlation functions relate to actually um, to actual um, observables, right? You want to have these sort of tra uh, transition functions as I discussed them for the quantum mechanics case. There is then a um, complicated theory of how you take these states, how they, how you encode these, these states with some fixed momentum uh, in the in the quantum field theory. You know, th they also live in some supposed uh, Hilbert space, let's say, um, you have to de compute a lot in uh, in momentum space, which by Fourier transform is sort of the dual to the the, the uh, position space that we talked about in the whole video. So there are some Fourier transforms uh, involved, and you pass from the phi's to this a's. So just to sketch this out here. Um, Yeah, so you have when I mean, these are I'm, I'm just throwing these formulas at you right but there's this typical relations between um the momentum space here ap and the 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 space-time uh fields and you you can view this as a sort of transitioning by Fourier transform uh, but uh the Fourier transform is with respect to space and also like you know momentum and space and also time and energy and the energy encodes the sort of relation that is uh, um, governed by the uh, Schrodinger equation relation and so all these things are, are fairly like uh, complex but in the end it's clear that um, once we have these G's we have to sort of fully transform them over to a momentum space and in momentum space we encode actually the input output state that we are actually interested in like this for some scattering transition probability stuff okay um and then um there is then some more theory that uh, gives you this momentum space in out transition amplitudes that you're actually interested in in terms of this this g's basically you see on this side here these are basically the g's and then from Fourier transforming and taking into account how the the frequency is and space is sort of uh, tied together through the evolution equations you get some nasty object here that you have to then compute and then with this um this uh, this formalism um, you get from the Green's functions to the transition uh, probability, right? So I, in these last 10 mi minutes, yeah, I just explained to you why these Gs are really the important thing that you want to get at. Once you have them, then in principle, you can uh, uh, compute this uh, transition probabilities. Um, and the neural network aspect gives you uh, a way to get at these Gs. Okay. So uh, lastly, I want also to mention that um, apart from the neural network kernel theory stuff, there's also the you know classical uh, information geometry approach where you um, you know you have the underlying parameters theta, which are the weights, and you can see them as encoding. Um, if you put a, uh, a distribution over the inputs and you get the distribution over the outputs which are governed by the parameters and then you get this information manifold so you had that information geometry uh, stuff this is like a, a related but different um mathematical angle that I, I just wanted to mention because we are like formally so close having all the important all these stochastics already but this is a little bit different nonetheless but also interesting 
there you have this neuro neuro um, manifold things. So this is also one line of research. I actually try to find um, things going into the this quantum field theory research direction in in deep learning books uh, in preparation for this video, um, and actually didn't find too much. So there there was more about the, this classical information geometry aspect to things. Um, and then also worth noting the applications to quantum field theory is not the only way in which people try to uh, apply neural network theory and all these nice formulas to physics. There's also uh, uh, this mathematical metric flow things uh, going on. I just mention it because if you look at, for example, the research groups um, that uh, put out this paper, then you will also f find these sort of uh, neural network applications uh, using quantum field theories. Okay, so I mean, at one hour, I know it has been a little bit fuzzy, but nonetheless, I think I, I uh, at least maybe you understood the neural network Gaussian process stuff and, and, and um, can see how this ties in with path integral formalisms. Um, and I motivated you I'm really, I know very few people will make it for a one hour, hour video of these sort of rants, but it's probably nonetheless, I think, the best way to uh, get an infusion of this sort of theory uh, in a digestible way and in a way where somebody highlights these things. So this is it's not a real excuse. I think it's nonetheless helpful, even if this was not very super prepared. Okay, uh, with that... Um, I leave it. I leave it at that. Um, I wish you a good uh, transition into the next year. Uh, I have no real vi videos planned um, for the upcoming months. Really, I mean, I have a folder with twenty started projects and videos I could talk about uh, that I might um, come back to, but probably not within the next months. But then, as I said, I might look more into classical. Um, classical functional analysis stuff for the sake of making a nice video about the universal approximation theorem and uh, at the latest then i will have a polished video take care